Phoebe Air from Oxford University Hospitals in the United Kingdom. Tonight, we're going to explore several exciting developments with covalent and non-covalent BTK inhibitors in relapse refractory mantle cell lymphoma. Before we move on, I'd like to thank Peerview for providing this session and Lily for providing the educational grants for this symposium. If you haven't already, please complete the pre-event survey and look out for additional follow-up polling during the presentation. We've also prepared practice aids that can be used to prepare for future developments with BTK inhibitors in mantle cell lymphoma that summarize many of the key points we'll make tonight. So please download these resources before we get started. Finally, submit your questions throughout this evening's program using the live chat feature, and Toby and I will address them during the presentation. We'll also have some further discussion on your questions during the Q&A. Let's begin. Real quickly, this is the link for peer review and the practice aids. Feel free to visit this website after the seminar um, and download these for your use. So to begin, I just want to review what is the current frontline care options for mantle cell lymphoma. And really the way that we approach this is based on the fitness of the patient. For those patients who are young and healthy and we think candidates for aggressive therapy, the induction options are chemoimmunotherapy um, with high dose treatments that often include a high dose cytarabine. So these are regimens such as RDHAP, RCHOP, alternating with RDHAP, the Nordic regimen, and hypersevat. For patients who are less fit, older, and are maybe not great candidates for anthracycline based or high dose ARAC based regimens, uh, we have less intensive options, and, and the most commonly used one is bendamustine in combination with rituximab, but other regimens are things like VR-CAP or lenalidomide with rituximab. For those patients who are potentially candidates for aggressive therapy, uh, there is consideration for an autologous transplant as part of frontline therapy to prolong the time uh, a patient can be in remission um, after being diagnosed. And then there's maintenance therapy for those patients as well, which has shown a survival benefit uh, with three years of maintenance therapy after induction chemotherapy. And so this is overall the general paradigms that we use, but as you'll see throughout today's talk, there's lots of new exciting therapies being developed that will challenge the frontline care in mantle cell lymphoma over the next three to five years. So what do we do in the second line? Well, it's become clear that BTK inhibitors are clearly the established second line treatment option for those who relapse with mantle cell lymphoma. So you can see here at the NCCN guidelines, that for second line, the preferred options do include the three approved BTK inhibitors that are available in the United States um, and regimens such as lenalidomide and rituximab. For those who um, get into a response, if they're young and healthy, you can consider consolidation with an allogeneic transplant. Or those that fail BTK inhibitors, consider CD19-based CAR T-cell therapy. The European guidelines here um, were published in 2017, and they have slightly different approvals. But you can see here that they also uh, recommend um, things like ibrutinib as a second line option, but also consider other chemotherapeutic options if they have not been given prior, um, and similarly consider things like allogeneic transplant as a consolidation procedure. So what is the status of BTK inhibitor approval in mantle cell lymphoma? So I sort of hinted towards some differences between the United States and Europe. In the United States, we're fortunate to have three different BTK inhibitors all approved in the second line setting. That includes ibrutinib and the second generation covalent BTK inhibitors, acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib. At this time uh, in Europe, ibrutinib is approved in the second line, but there are ongoing studies that hopefully will get these other agents such as acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib approved um, in Europe as well. Uh, very exciting are some new non-covalent BTK inhibitors, which have a different mechanism of action than our covalent BTK inhibitors. Um, and those are both in the clinical trial setting uh, with a phase three clinical trial that Dr. Ayer will talk about shortly with pertubrutinib and nemtubrutinib, which is currently in phase two clinical trials. So the real question becomes, what is the difference between all of these BTK inhibitors and do we really need so many different agents? Well, each one is unique, and if you look at these kinome maps, ibrutinib being the first agent in this class is a very effective BTK inhibitor, but it had a lot of off-target effects, uh, inhibiting other kinases which may not be desirable 
as that can lead to off-target toxicities. So the second generation BTK inhibitors such as acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib um, also were effective in targeting BTK, but unlike ibrutinib, were more selective. And you can see here in the KinoMap have less off-target toxicities. We now have a new generation of BTK inhibitors called reversible or non-covalent BTK inhibitors. Um, and you can see here some of the different agents that are being investigated, all in the clinical trial setting. But again, they have high selectivity for BTK uh, and, and less off-target sort of inhibition of other kinases, which again, can be potentially less desirable in certain clinical settings. So what do we know so far? Well, with these second generation BTK inhibitors um, that are more selective, uh, that they have less off-target effects. And in those earlier generation ones, like ibrutinib, I have more off-target effects. So what happens with drugs like ibrutinib is that it has off-target kinases inhibited, such as TEC and EGFR, and that can explain some of the toxicity profile that we now very well understand with ibrutinib. Things like the bleeding risk, the cardiotoxicity, which can manifest with high blood pressure or atrial fibrillation, and then things like rash and some of the GI toxicities and arthralgias that we see. Well, why is this important? Is that these toxicities can often become an issue of tolerance. And, and so that can be a reason why patients are, have to stop these sort of medications. Are the newer generation drugs different? Well, we know that from head-to-head -head trials, uh, both the Aspen and Alpine studies include, and the Elevate RR, that there's less toxicities associated with these second generation BTK inhibitors, such as acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib, and we think that's because they have less off-target toxicities. So what are the barriers to the effective use of BTK inhibitors in mantle cell lymphoma? Well, first, resistance is a problem. Unlike CLL, where the pathway to resistance is a little bit better understood, in mantle cell lymphoma, the mechanism of resistance is less defined. We know that there are going to be mutations within some of the downstream uh, enzymes that are involved in the BTK pathway. And so what happens is you get target modification, you can get bypass of the activated pathway, or there could be issues in the tumor microenvironment. But ultimately, what ends up happening is that despite, you know, a, despite binding BTK, that these uh, oral agents are no longer effective in terms of stopping the proliferation of the tumor. And so you can see here some of the mutations that have been identified in mantle cell lymphoma. But again, there's not been one defined pathway, um, which is different than in CLL, where, where a certain mutation in the C481 has been identified in, as a recurrent mutation in those that develop resistance to covalent BTK inhibitors. What happens when patients with mantle cell lymphoma progress after BTK inhibitors? And this is really where real world data really comes to use. Because you wanna know, you know, are these patients doing well or not? And unfortunately, when you fail a BTK inhibitor, it's almost like falling off a cliff. Uh, in general, these patients have very poor overall survival. And for those patients who fail ibrutinib and don't receive any further therapy, in one retrospective study, the median overall survival was just 1.4 months. Now you can see here that if you're able to receive some systemic therapy um, on the left graph and the right, that patients may do a little bit better, but you're still looking at a median survival of one year or less. And so it goes to show that while these are very effective agents, new strategies are needed for those patients who fail covalent BTK inhibitors. Why do patients stop these agents? Well, obviously, we just talked about progression, mechanisms of resistance uh, being a major reason why these drugs are stopped. But unfortunately, that is not the only reason they're stopped. Another major issue, which I alluded to earlier, is the toxicity of these agents. And, and so it can be a tolerance issue. Patients can have excessive bleeding. They can develop cardiovascular toxicities. And while the newer generation drugs provide less of these off-target toxicities, they too can also lead to toxicities that require a patient to have to stop a drug. Now this data set here is looking specifically at 159 patients that were treated with ibrutinib, and they found that the overall discontinuation rate was 83.6%. Now again, a third of those patients in the whole population was due to disease progression, but the second leading cause for ibrutinib discontinuation was not lack of efficacy, but toxicity with about 25% of patients stopping for that reason.
And so again, goes to show that newer generation drugs are required to potentially limit that toxicity profile, allowing patients to maintain uh, this drug on an ongoing basis. So uh, that was a quick introduction to sort of where things are in mantle cell lymphoma. And, and then tonight's masterclass in case form is really going to focus on um, what is the role for sequential therapy and relapse refractory mantle cell lymphoma. And again, looking not only at the established BTK options, but some of the emerging BTK therapies, such as non-covalent inhibitors, which I briefly mentioned earlier. And then we're going to end with a case-based discussion with myself and Dr. Ayer, talking specifically about therapeutic sequencing in mantle cell lymphoma and how we would approach some of these difficult cases. And finally, we'll summarize the data presented today and do a quick question and answer. And with that, I'd like to hand this off to Dr. Ayer, who's going to lead you through uh, the next section of this talk, which is going to be the evidence of modernizing sequential care with BTK inhibitors. Thank you, Toby. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shah, for that excellent introduction. And uh, yeah, it's my pleasure to discuss the, um, the evidence for modern sequential care with BTK inhibitors. So as, as Nira very nicely mentioned, there are three approved um, FDA BTK inhibitor products available. Um, and this is a summary slide of the data that, um, that was produced from the phase two clinical studies. As you can see, um, over 100 patients in the phase two ibrutinib study, uh, at the acalabrutinib study, and just under um, 100 patients from the zanabrutinib study, which was exclusively performed um, in the Far East in China. We can see there are some subtle differences between the different cohorts. One of the most important ones is the abrutinib cohort is uh, a slightly higher risk group of patients with a median of three prior lines compared to um, slightly fewer prior lines with acalabrutinib and zanabrutinib. The zanabrutinib cohort is also considerably younger than the, um, the other two studies. Um, and the overall response rate ranging between approximately 70 to 80 percent across the studies You'll note that the CR rates are higher with um, the acalabrutinib and zanabrutinib trials. Um, the method of um, response assessment was slightly different to the abrutinib study, so PET-CT scans were used in those studies, so that may explain some of the differences. And what you can see is that the, when you look, when you take the study as a whole, the median duration of response looks roughly equivalent, um, obviously challenging to compare across the studies. And same too with the median progression-free survival, perhaps slightly longer with the zanabrutinib study, as I'll show you a bit later, but again, really hard to compare across studies. Um, as 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 Nirav um, discussed briefly, the adverse event profile is slightly different with these agents, and certainly the second generation BTK inhibitors do, do look to be um, better tolerated in terms of uh, cardiovascular uh, risk profile particularly, um, but all of these agents do have their own unique BTK-related toxicities, including cytopenias, bleeding, myalgia, arthralgia, and cardiac um, issues such as atrial fibrillation, and we'll talk more about that a bit later. When should you use a BTK inhibitor and when is it most effective and what kind of outcomes can you expect? Well, the best data that we have probably comes from the pooled analysis of the uh, three clinical trials performed with ibrutinib. So patients were pulled together and analyses were performed looking at uh, response uh, depth and how that predicts progression-free survival and also where you best benefit from using a BTK inhibitor. And this is really long-term follow-up published this year um, from these studies and the experience with ibrutinib, so 10-year follow-up. And what you can see here is that if you achieve a complete remission, you have a, a markedly improved progression-free survival compared to those who achieve only a partial response. And of course, that's potentially relevant when CAR T-cell therapy is available following a BTK inhibitor. Um, similarly, if you use a BTK inhibitor at, at first relapse rather than subsequent relapses, you can see also this seems to predict for uh, the median progression-free survival. So over two years, the median progression-free survival relapse compared to less than a year if you use it at subsequent relapses. So again, um, there are some very simple and basic um, clinical characteristics that can help define um, how patients do. And this is really relevant for, uh, for managing sequential therapy in mantle cell lymphoma. Of course, with uh, the BTK data from the second and line setting and beyond, it, it's natural to want to study the agent or any one of those agents in the frontline setting. Now, ibrutinib has been around, of course, the longest. And so we've seen recently published frontline data of 
um, ibrutinib in combination with bendamustine rituximab compared to bendamustine rituximab um, maintenance therapy with ibrutinib and rituximab given in the experimental arm and uh, rituximab alone in the investigation alarm. So the SHINE trial has been published, very long follow-up at its first readout of the trial, and published in the New England Journal of Medicine this year. And what you can see here is there is a, uh, a progression-free survival advantage for the addition of abrutinib, which of course comes at a cost of additional toxicity. Um, so the discontinuation rates due to toxicity uh, with the ibrutinib arm and the median time on ibrutinib in the whole study of approximately two years does speak to some of the challenges of delivering the combination. And we certainly await uh, formal approval of this combination globally and also uh, a better understanding of who may benefit from this therapy and who we should give it to in the future. So back to the phase two study, data with acalabrutinib. So this is the, the ACE-LY004 trial now published and presented a number of times. Um, demonstrating high efficacy with acalabrutinib as monotherapy, the overall response rate over 80%, CR rates 40%, and you can see here the median progression-free survival of approximately 20 months. And this is uh, a product that is uh, available in the US, and um, as, as Nirav has said, um, has demonstrated superior safety um, in a uh, slightly different setting in, in CLL. Um, and there's no, to date, there's no uh, randomized head-to-head -head data in mantle cell lymphoma comparing ibrutinib with acalabrutinib and zanabrutinib. Here's the long-term follow-up data of the zanabrutinib study. Um, as I mentioned, the median progression-free survival in this cohort was 33 months, with, again, high response rates of over 80%. Um, so intriguing that the median PFS seems to be potentially a little bit longer with this agent, and um, it would be interesting to study um, this uh, product again in further clinical trials to, to understand whether this efficacy is seen um, in other patient populations as well. This is a well-tolerated second-generation BTK inhibitor and again represents a, a good option as a, B, as a covalent BTK inhibitor in relapsed mantle cell lymphoma. But of course, these therapies aren't curative, as I've mentioned to you. And as you can see from those Kaplan-Meier curves, um, patients will continue to progress. And so there's an ongoing need for development of further therapy following covalent BTK inhibitors. And at present, uh, anti-CD19 CAR T-cell therapy represents uh, a highly effective uh, treatment modality in patients who have progressed following a covalent BTK inhibitor. This is data from the Zuma 2 study, which we've seen again presented previously and updated uh, at recent congresses. Now this therapy um, is highly effective. So the Zuma 2 study demonstrated in over 70 patients an overall response rate of 92%, with the majority of patients, so 67% of patients, achieving a complete remission. Now the efficacy does come at a cost. There are some unique toxicities associated with anti-CD19 CAR T-cell, Therapy, cytopenias, infection, neurological toxicities, particularly in this with this product. So 31% of patients developing grade three or greater neurological toxicity, and also 15% of patients developing grade three or more um, cytokine release syndrome. syndrome. Um, those adverse events are notable, and of course, um, the use of this therapy requires careful patient selection and also identification of patients who may benefit from this therapy um, almost prior to the delivery of um, or the thought of the, the, the use of CAR T-cell therapy when patients are on a BTK inhibitor. This is a long-term follow-up and I just really want you to focus on the, um, the top line, so the blue curve, which is the 67% um, so of the two-thirds of patients achieving a complete remission. And what you can see here is that these patients are developing very durable disease control. So the two-year um, progression-free survival is over 70% and the median PFS has just been reached at four years. But you can see here those, those achieving a complete remission are getting gaining very durable uh, responses. So that's extremely encouraging. And also uh, this has been backed up by recent real-world data demonstrating again high levels of efficacy um, across a number of uh, studies. And also what's also encouraging here is that some of the patients with higher risk features also seem to benefit from CAR T cell therapy as well. 
So there are other agents also in development in the post-covalent BTK setting, and NIRAV has already nicely described um, the mechanism of action of pertubrutinib, which is a highly selective, reversible, non-covalent BTK inhibitor being studied in the Bruin trial. So this is a very large phase one, two study of which there are over 600 patients enrolled at present. And you can see here from this schema, um, 134 patients are and at this data cut that I'll show you in a minute, there were 111 patients available for efficacy, of whom 100 patients had received a prior covalent BTK inhibitor. This is the summary of the overall efficacy data, and you can see here that in those 100 patients, the overall response rate was just over 50%, with complete remissions achieved in 25% of patients. And you can see from the waterfall plot a number of deep responses in terms of tumour reduction. What's also interesting is that patients who had had a prior stem cell transplant also responded uh, well to this therapy, and also there was a small number of patients post-CAR T-cell therapy that also had uh, response rates consistent with the overall patient population. What is particularly interesting about um, this agent and uh, the data to date in this study is how durable these responses are. So with a relatively short follow-up, you can see here that in the patients who've responded to therapy, the, the median duration of response looks to be approximately 18 months. Now, of course, longer follow-up is needed here to gain a clearer understanding of this, but this is certainly very encouraging. And of course, extremely intriguing that a BTK inhibitor can re-induce response rates of 50% with durability to those responses in patients who've previously been exposed to a covalent BTK inhibitor. One of the other impressive uh, aspects to this agent is the safety profile. So uh, this large phase two study um, enabled a, a good understanding of the adverse event profile of this drug. And what you can see here from a summary of patients across the whole study, so these are uh, patients with uh, a range of B-cell malignancies, uh, generally heavily pretreated patients, is that the grade three, four uh, toxicity rates are extremely low. Really, the main adverse events that are seen with this agent are, are minor bruising um, and uh, mild neutropenia in, in a proportion of patients, um, as well as uh, occasional uh, low-grade diarrhea and fatigue. Um, but really, the grade 3, 4 adverse events are extremely uncommon um, across the whole patient population. And so this data has led to um, the... Uh, in great interest in this agent and the uh, desire to study this uh, agent further um, up the patient pathway. And so a randomized phase three study, a superiority design comparing pertubrutinib with investigator's choice, covalent BTK inhibitors. So uh, depending on the availability um, uh, globally of um, ibrutinib, acalabrutinib or zanabrutinib, the investigator can choose those agents uh, and there is a one-to-one -one design with a stratification of the simplified MIPI, uh, the uh, comparative BTK inhibitor and the number of prior lines of therapy. And this is actively enrolling at present. So with that, I'll finish and I'll hand over to Nirav, who's going to finish up talking about some of the safety aspects of BTK inhibition. Great, thank you so much, Toby, for that excellent overview. So um, going into the sort of safety here, so what is the overall safety experience with BTK inhibitors? So I think, you know, we've sort of talked both of us about some of the well-known toxicities with really the covalent BTK inhibitors. That's what I'm going to focus on. Um, and those are things like atrial fibrillation. That's a well-established problem. There's a bleeding risk um, with BTK inhibitors. Long-term cardiovascular risk, I think, is something we're really learning more about. Um, and that comes in the form of hypertension, um, there's GI toxicities with uh, patients having sort of bowel issues or diarrhea. And then like with any other oral chemotherapeutic agent, there is still an infection risk. Uh, Dr. Ayer mentioned the neutropenia that you can see with BTK inhibitors. Um, so what have we learned uh, based on these toxicities? So with the bleeding risk, ideally you don't want to give this concomitantly with warfarin. Um, although, you know, there are other patients that we use non-warfarin-based anticoagulation uh, so some of our newer uh, direct oral anticoagulants can be given uh, for patients with new onset AFib. And you want to manage some of these problems, right? You want to let these people have long-standing hypertension. So um, it's important to manage this with your primary care doctor um, and make sure that that's under control um, and watch for arrhythmias. And obviously the bleeding and bruising can be serious. Some patients can have GI bleeding. 
and, and ongoing monitoring for neutropenia, infections, and secondary malignancies. And so this really is a team-based based management approach. And, and so uh, we often work with our cardio-oncologist, our primary care doctors, and, and other uh, colleagues to help uh, manage some of the toxicities uh, that occur with uh, long-term use of BTK inhibitors. And that really is a way that they're given uh, in mantle cell lymphoma is to continue until progression. So um, what do we know about BTK inhibitors specifically in mantle cell lymphoma versus CLL? Uh, in mantle cell lymphoma, often these patients have had different prior lines of treatment. Um, in diseases like CLL, BTK inhibitors are now basically a frontline therapy uh, whereas in mantle cell, they could be a second or third line treatment. Some of these patients could have had a prior autologous stem cell transplant, uh, medications like bendamustine, uh, which can cause a lot of leukopenia. And so uh, there's more neutropenia, and potentially that can lead to more infectious complications. Uh, similar to CLL, obviously intolerance is a problem uh, regardless of disease uh, phenotype, and, and that can be a reason and can prompt a change in therapy. Uh, the good news is, is that we do have more than one BTK therapy option, and so you can sort of pick the agent based on the toxicity profile, how it's administered, drug-drug uh, interactions, and choose the best agent for your patient, or potentially even switch agent classes if you need to. Um, so you can switch to a totally different class of agents. Um, you can use a different or more selective BTK inhibitor. And, you know, in the future, again, assuming that some of these newer drugs do get approved by the FDA and, and by the European Union, you may have options with non-covalent BTK inhibitors as well uh, for those who are covalent BTK inhibitor intolerant. So um, what about sequencing? Uh, so it appears to be effective when it's BTK intolerant disease. So one thing to know about covalent BTK inhibitors is that in general, we think that if you are resistant to those drugs, uh, whether that be to ibrutinib or acalabrutinib or xanabrutinib, that we do think that you're going to be uh, resistant in terms of therapeutic efficacy to all of them. However, there is data that you can give an alternative agent in those patients who are, who are intolerant uh, to the BTK inhibitor that they're getting. So this was some data looking at xanabrutinib, uh, and patients who had intolerance issues with ibrutinib or acalabrutinib, um, and they looked at the recurrence rate of that AE, um, and you can see here that the majority of patients did not have recurrence, um, and, and what the severity was, and you can see that the majority, when it did re reoccur, um, that the severity of the toxicity was less with xanabrutinib. Um, alternatively, you can always switch to an alternative agent class, and so this is looking at data for lenalidomide, um, in patients who had discontinued ibrutinib due to toxicity or lack of efficacy. Now, that's a little bit more convoluted of a population. Um, lack of efficacy often, you know, after BTK inhibitors makes it difficult for other oral agents to work. Um, but you can see here that at least the overall response rate was 29%, uh, but there were no unexpected toxicities. Again, this was a more highly refractory group of patients, and so take that into account when thinking about the efficacy signal here. So what about a non-covalent BTK inhibitor? Could this be an option um, in those patients who have discontinued BTK inhibitor uh, for toxicity uh, or other reasons? And so, uh, you know, Dr. Ayer sort of went over some of this data, but I want to really focus you in on this sort of lighter shade of blue this time. And you can see here that those patients who discontinued BTK for toxicity purposes continue to have high levels of efficacy, um, which is really important. And so you can see here that the pre-treated patients, the overall response rate was basically the same as to those patients who were BTK naive. Again, the majority of patients were exposed to BTK inhibitors. And so it is possible that uh, non-covalent uh, or reversible BTK inhibitors, if FDA approved, may be an option in the setting of intolerance to the current covalent BTK inhibitors. And, and from the data here, uh, it's exciting to see that there might be high levels of efficacy with this approach. So uh, what are our take-homes for mantle cell lymphoma? Um, I want to again thank Dr. Ayer for going through the data. Um, we really talked about a lot of different aspects of relapsed mantle cell lymphoma. I think number one, it is well established that covalent BTK inhibitors are the therapy of choice for relapsed mantle cell lymphoma with data really establishing it as a second line therapy. Now, as mentioned earlier, you know, if uh, regimens such as SHINE allow BTK inhibitors to be given in a frontline therapy, this will shift the algorithms that we use 
Uh, but the time being, it is an established second line treatment. What else did we learn today is that yes, there are some patients who get, B who get BTK inhibitors um, and can have a long remission, especially those patients that were sort of discussed by Dr. Ayer who achieved a complete remission. However, we don't think of this as a curative intent therapy. And so relapse continues to be a clinical challenge uh, for patients with mantle cell lymphoma on BTK inhibitors. So what do we do when you fail a covalent BTK inhibitor? Uh, right now, you know, we're lucky to have uh, exciting therapies like CAR T cell uh, therapy targeting the CD19 protein um, is a standard of care option here in the United States. But the toxicity profile um, is something that needs to be taken into account for. And given that mantle cell lymphoma is a disease that disproportionately affects older patients, it may not be an option for all of our patients who have relapsed mantle cell lymphoma. Um, I think we shared some exciting data here today about what's uh, what's coming, you know, what's really on the horizon, and, and really exciting data for non-covalent BTK inhibitors that have a different mechanism of action um, than our current covalent BTK inhibitors, and have shown, at least in the setting of a clinical trial, to have high levels of efficacy, even though there's been prior BTK exposure, and perhaps a different toxicity profile that is not overlapping with what we have seen with the current class of agents. So, um, you know, from here, I'd like to sort of hand it back to Dr. Ayer, and we're going to go through some cases, uh, which will really highlight uh, some of our thoughts on how we handle these patients with complex mantle cell lymphoma. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shah, for that excellent overview of the safety profile considerations uh, with patients on, on BTK inhibitors. So what I'm going to do is uh, lead a couple of cases and then hand over to, to Dr. Shah for his views and then we'll switch over for the third case. So uh, this is the first case um, that we'd like to discuss. So this is Robert. He's an older patient receiving, uh, who's receiving uh, immunochemotherapy followed by a covalent BTK inhibitor. So Robert initially presents with mantle cell lymphoma at the age of 73 and he has no comor major comorbidities. His biopsy um, at diagnosis shows a relatively high key 67 at 50%. He's got a good performance status. And he initially presents with weight loss and fatigue and splenomegaly. So I think most people would agree that he would require treatment at the uh, initial presentation. So you, um, there are obviously potential options here to decide on therapy and the patient uh, received bendamustin rituximab and because of his uh, age and preference, declined a uh, stem cell transplant consolidation, again, probably reasonably. Um, and he achieved approximately a three-year remission from bendamustin rituximab initially, and then presented three years later with weight loss and abdominal pain and had a PET-CT scan which showed abdominal disease and disease in his thorax. Now, at this point, different BTK inhibitors were available um, as options and uh, the physician looking after him decided to use a calibrutinib monotherapy, a standard dose of 100 milligrams twice a day. And he received that for a year, tolerated it well, but unfortunately progressed after a year on therapy uh, on the a calibrutinib. So as a recap now, he's now 77 years old and his performance status has fallen off slightly because of the uh, two episodes of disease progression and the prior treatment and his increased age. So the question here is how to characterize this patient and decide on the next steps. So the questions um, I'd like to ask um, Nirav here, if it's okay, is, um, is, he, uh, uh, is he relapsing with what you would consider aggressive disease or BTK resistant disease? Would you consider somebody of this age to be a candidate for CAR T cell therapy? Um, and if not, what other options would you consider? Yeah, um, thank you for, for sharing this case, uh, Toby. You know, I, I think this is really a very excellent case because it's, it's what we see um, in the clinic. Um, really to go through this in a little bit more detail, um, you know, I think at age 73, I probably would have give, considered bendamustine rituximab outside of a clinical trial. Uh, as an appropriate frontline therapy. And, and an auto transplant at age 73 um, comes with a lot of risk. And, and so I think it's reasonable that, that the patient declined to pursue this. Um, but this is what we see. You know, you get remissions that are maybe three to five years with frontline BR. And, and I think, again, here I would have done the same thing. You know, at the time of relapse, uh, we had a, really a robust discussion today that the BTK inhibitors 
are the appropriate second line therapy. Uh, unfortunately, in this patient, you know, he had progressive disease, uh, which is really probably about the median progression free survival of these drugs, about a year to, to 16 months. Uh, but he's older. And, and this is what happens with age. His performance score is not as good as when he was first diagnosed. So um, one, you know, is he relapsing after aggressive, uh, you know, with aggressive disease and, and that's BTK resistant? I think the answer here is yes. Um, there is progressive disease here. Uh, and, you know, ideally we try to biopsy these patients and, and try to characterize it. Sometimes patients do pick up new mutations. Uh, sometimes they have new histological issues. They now have blastoid features. And so um, that can help sort of uh, characterize the disease a little bit better. Um, but, but what do we do next? And so I think the biggest question that, you know, unfortunately, you know, a, an age is just a number and, and performance scores are difficult to translate, but I would at least evaluate the patient for CAR T-cell therapy because we know it has such a high overall response rate. Um, even these patients that have failed prior, prior BTK inhibitor therapy. So I think it's definitely a consideration, but I would be nervous. Um, you know, Dr. Ayer mentioned, you know, uh, that about a third of the patients can get pretty significant neurotoxicity, infectious issues or a complication. And, and having done a lot of CAR-T, um, it's not often that patients necessarily die of cytokine release um, or neurotoxicity, but is that when those things happen at age 77, uh, the patients get debilitated, they end up in a nursing home, then they're not able to recover, and, and ultimately they end up passing a, an infectious complication, a fall, is something that wasn't necessarily directly related to the CAR T cell treatment, but something that impacted their quality of life. So I, I think this is a tough call on CAR T. I'd want to evaluate him, see him. Um, I think that he's at least worth the conversation. So if you're at a referring center, I'd at least refer him to have that uh, conversation. Um, but then I would think about clinical trials. Um, in particular, if I had a non-covalent inhibitor, um, I think that's a very mild therapy uh, that you could potentially offer this patient. I think lenalidomide is an option, um, you know, in this setting. And then there's some data for venetoclax, but again, um, that data after BTK inhibitors may not be as efficacious um, as we've seen in some of the studies where this combined with the BTK inhibitor. So um, I, I think that this is, you know, a very real case looking at the type of patients we see at this age. Um, Toby, what do you think? Yeah, thank you, Nirav. I mean, I think you've explained really nicely some of the kind of challenges here. Um, I, I'd agree with everything you said. I agree he has clearly got covalent BTK resistant disease. The question of whether he's fit for CAR T cell therapy is uh, the, the key one. It's nuanced. It's challenging. Um, it can involve a number of other factors such as people's social support, whether they've uh, tolerated prior therapy well, their wishes as well. So a variety of things to, to consider here. I'd, I'd agree. I mean, I think my, my concern here is the neurotoxicity that you see um, with um, the CAR-T product here. And we know that neurotoxicity is more common in older patients. So that that would make me nervous. But it, as, as, as you've said, it wouldn't necessarily make me fully um, exclude it. And, and of course, d depending on where he is, whether he'd have to travel, whether he has the network of support to, to actually have that therapy are, are very key things. And I agree. I mean, clinical trials, he, he has no comor major comorbidities. Obviously, he's more, more um, fatigued and has a slightly worse performance status than previously. But absolutely, we know there are a number of very active agents in clinical trials in this space. Um, and so I'd certainly consider those um, agents like bispecifics, row one antibodies, et cetera, all look potentially active here as well. Um, so those those would be the other kind of options as well as the agents you've mentioned, um, lenalidomide, potentially venetoclax as well. Great. So here are the, the kind of key recommendations from this case. So um, uh, we, I think we both agree that progression on a covalent BTK inhibitor signals likely resistance. The use of therefore other covalent BTK inhibitors is unlikely to be beneficial. Of course, that's never been prospectively tested in mantle cell lymphoma, but certainly uh, logic suggests it wouldn't be um, a, a, a good option. Um, CAR T cell uh, therapy is, is, is an approved option, as we've, as we've mentioned. Um, but some of the key safety and logistical aspects are really key considerations. And non-covalent covalent BTK inhibitors such as pertubrugenib, as we've discussed and shown the data, um, represents a, a very reasonable, safe and easily deliverable alternative in a patient such as this.
Okay, so um, patient, case two is a is a, um, a kind of an adjustment of the of the prior case, and really is a aim to ask the question: what um, what would we do if Robert was able to unable to continue the covalent BTK inhibitor because of toxicity? So we've altered the case slightly here. Now Robert initially presents with mantle cell lymphoma at seventy three again, um, no comorbidities, key sixty seven, etc., and presentation otherwise unchanged. And again, he pursues. Uh, bendamustin rituximab has a remission of three years as previously described, but this time he was commenced on single agent uh, ibrutinib at the standard dose of 560 milligrams once a day. And this was used and he initially responds to treatment, but he experiences atrial fibrillation and hypertension on the drug and actually discontinues the agent despite multiple attempts to both dose hold and adjust the agent and to manage the atrial fibrillation and the hypertension. So he's now 77 again. He has the same performance status as the prior case, so performance status that's fallen off slightly um, since diagnosis. And the key questions here are, um, what are the next steps? So he he's responded initially, should he continue um, on the abrutinib at a lower dose? Um, should you switch to a more selective covalent BTK inhibitor? So xanabrutinib, acalabrutinib. Should he switch to a non-covalent BTK inhibitor? Should you try a different class of therapy altogether, given his toxicity issues with B the BTK inhibitor class? Or should you say that um, he has now been failed by the BTK inhibitor class and move forward onto CAR T cell therapy? So, Nera, I'd be interested in your thoughts on this case. Wow, can I say all of the above? Um, <laughs> You know, I, you know, it just goes to show, right, these are the cases that come into the clinic, and, and there is, I think, more than one right answer here. Um, you know, it, you know, it looks like this patient was responding, and I think the piece of information here, um, you know, that I would take into account is if he's really having intolerance, if he is in a complete remission, maybe I could give him a treatment holiday even, right? You know, stop the ibrutinib, understanding that at some point he will probably progress. Um, that's sort of a data-free area, but I've done it, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis, especially in older patients for quality of life. And as you mentioned earlier, Toby, you know, patient choices and wishes can be taken into account. Um, but the other logical thing to do, I think, is, you know, just try a selective covalent BTK inhibitor. Uh, we're lucky that we have two other drugs in the United States that are approved, and uh, we don't necessarily have head-to-head -head data for all of them in mantle cell. But if you extrapolate the safety data, not so much the efficacy signal that might be might exist in different uh, clinical settings, um, it does seem like uh, some of these newer agents may have some different toxicity profiles, may be a little bit milder. And so that would probably be my natural choice in this setting is that he's responding. Um, I don't know the depth of his response here and to a selective uh, covalent BTK inhibitor. So one of the second generation drugs um, acalabrutinib or xanabrutinib, and, and really hard to select between those two. I, I really look at, you know, drug-drug uh, interactions, dosing schedules, et cetera, uh, when making that choice. However, um, if we had, and we did previously have a clinical trial with the non-covalent BTK inhibitor, uh, if that was available, you know, based on some of the data we saw from the Bruin study, it seems like there is not a lot of overlapping toxicities. Uh, and some of the data that we talked about actually showed that, you know, high efficacy even in the setting of prior BTK exposure. So uh, these drugs are not, unfortunately, available for me to just switch to. But, you know, if I had the right clinical trial or, or in a clinical setting where this drug is FDA approved, I think definitely a good option, right? He's 77, performance status isn't great. Um, and, and so, you know, I think a consideration. Um, you can always switch class, but again, I, I like BTK inhibitors. I think they're sort of the best in class. Uh, for oral agents, so I wouldn't be that keen if I could find a different way to administer a BTK. And then um, I don't want to sort of go into CAR-T all over again, but it's the same considerations, right? Um, you know, I, I sort of focus more on the safety signal here, but um, I think Toby really highlighted some of the logistical things you have to think about as well. Um, and so I, I think that's sort of where I would take this case. Uh, Toby, would you do anything differently? Yeah, I think the, you've you've covered all of the key points here. I mean, to to my mind, this is a question about whether you go for a more selective covalent BTK inhibitor next, or whether you switch to a non-covalent BTK inhibitor. Assuming, of course, all are available and you can kind of take your pick. Um, I think the data at the moment, sort of across the literature, suggests going to a going to a covalent BTK inhibitor is probably reasonable, and then you know 
you know, theoretically, you have a non-covalent BTK inhibitor you can still subsequently use. Um, I would absolutely stick with targeting BTK, whatever you do, because as you say, it's the most you know, active therapeutic kind of target um, in mantle cell lymphoma for a patient such as this. Um, and each of the drugs you mentioned, acalabrutinib, zanabrutinib, pertabrutinib, all have very good kind of cardiovascular risk profiles. And so we're, we're you're potentially here quite spoiled for choice, which is a, a great place to be. Um, but uh, yeah, I suppose, it, you know, the, the answer sort of depends on availability, doesn't it, at any given point in time. But uh, I would probably stick in in class, probably go for a covalent BTK inhibitor first and, and, and go from there. Um, I agree, I share your concerns about CAR T-cell therapy in this patient. I'd certainly want to exhaust the BTK class before I moved um, a bit beyond it. Um, great. So uh, recommendations here. So additional ibrutinib um, dose adjustments uh, seem probably unlikely to work, mostly because, as we've described in this case, um, he's experienced uh, atrial fibrillation and hypertension despite multiple attempts at dose adjustments. But of course here, just to highlight the importance of involving other specialties such as um, cardio-oncologists, um, those with a sp specific interest in, in, in oncology can be really valuable here. Um, they develop a good understanding of the, the agents and the, the treatment um, modalities available and, and can be of great value. So certainly encourage um, consultation with them. And the current data probably supports the use of more selective BTK inhibitors as we've discussed. Um, but as the Bruin study has demonstrated, non-covalent BTK inhibitors, particularly pertabrutinib, does look to be a particularly useful agent in, in, in BTK intolerant um, patients as well as those resistant. Um, so uh, certainly another strong contender here. And as, as with the earlier um, scenario, really the same conclusions exist with regards to CAR T cell therapy and, and older patients. And there are other agents, as mentioned, venetoclax, uh, lenalidomide, that are useful. But um, I think we'd agree that, uh, that, um, that really exhausting the BTK um, therapeutic options is probably reasonable initially. Great. Thank you. Great. Well, I'll hand over to Nirav to um, talk through case three. Great. Now I get to put Toby on the spot here. So... Uh, we're going to take the same story and again, just switch it up just a little bit. And I think this is really, you know, um, emerging data because we, we saw the results for Shine. It's been published now. And, and so uh, what if you get a novel BTK inhibitor with chemotherapy regimen up front? So, so not going to go through the patient again. You know, the same patient, age 73 when you start. He was enrolled in a clinical trial and he received um, ibrutinib with bendamustine and rituxan. And he did well. He had a long progression-free survival, you know, suggestive with the data that, that uh, Dr. Ayer went over earlier today. But now, five years later, has weight loss, abdominal pain. Um, a PET CT shows that there's recurrent disease. And uh, the patient sort of uh, had received continuous ibrutinib up until the progression time point. So he's 78 years old. Uh, progression, uh, sorry, performance score is now one to two. And so... Um, you know, Toby, what are the next steps? So you've already exhausted um, our favorite drug here, our covalent BTK inhibitors. Uh, would you consider a different covalent BTK? Would you sort of say, hey, it's time for CAR-T now, um, use of non-covalent BTK inhibitors, or I guess something else? Yeah, thank you, Nirav. Um, yeah, good questions. And I, th I think we'll see patients such as this in the future. Obviously, a number of patients in clinical trials around the world have received a covalent BTK inhibitor frontline with or without chemotherapy and a CD20 antibody. So this, I think this kind of scenario is going to become more common in the next you know, few years. Um, is there a role for other covalent BTK inhibitors? Um, I don't think so. So um, again, I guess we've kind of touched on this point already, but th this patient does progress on ibrutinib, which I think is a really relevant point. Noting that patients in the SHINE study actually often stop because of intolerance, that may be a slightly different kind of treatment approach in those patients. But in somebody who who progresses through ibrutinib, I wouldn't use xanabrutinib or acalabrutinib. I don't think we have the, the data here. Now, of course, um, would early use, so effectively first relapse use of CAR T-cell therapy be appropriate here? So 
Um, I suppose that the short answer is that it's available and potentially appropriate in, in the US. So it has a slightly broader approval than it does in Europe, where you've got to have two prior lines of therapy and a prior BTK inhibitor. I think in the US, you just have to have relapsed mantle cell lymphoma. So the CAR T cell therapy is available. I think really the same considerations exist um, as we discussed earlier. He's 78, this this patient now, so even slightly older with 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 um, a, a performance status um, that's slightly borderline. So I think all those considerations are still relevant. Um, would I use a non-covalent BTK inhibitor here? Well, I think that's a very interesting question. I mean, obviously patients from the Bruin study had a median of three prior lines of therapy. Um, now, so, so, so patients who kind of came in at first relapse were pretty uncommon. But of course, you know, in theory, this, this patient's been exposed to the kind of standard three treatment uh, modalities that we have at our disposal other than CAR T cell therapy in CD20 antibody, covalent BTK inhibitor and chemotherapy. So it, in, ma in many respects, um, I, I would consider the use of pertubrutinib to be potentially very appropriate here. You've got covalent BTK inhibitor resistance, prior chemotherapy, prior CD20 antibody. It kind of broadly, to my mind, fits in that um, uh, in the patient population that have been studied, albeit in a kind of slightly different and nuanced way. So I, I think the discussion, to my mind, again, is around non-covalent BTK inhibitor or CAR T cell therapy. And I think I probably, in a patient like this, would go for a non-covalent BTK inhibitor first, or of course, as we've talked about, clinical trials, were they to be uh, an option. Um, Nirav, what would you do? Yeah, uh, I think I basically agree with you. I think um, it's nice to see that we're sort of practicing uh, similarly, despite um, being on different continents. Um, I, I think you're highlighting the reality. Um, there's going to be more of these patients out there. In fact, I got a call the other day about a patient who's never seen chemotherapy, but seen ibrutinib then and CAR-T <laughs> um, and progressed through those three lines. So I, I think, but for this patient in particular, right, he got five years. He's older now, even older than our previous cases. Uh, honestly, if I had a non-covalent BTK inhibitor, I think that would be my go-to choice. He's had only one really line of therapy. And so um, I would probably try that next based on the safety profile and the data we have um, from the clinical trials. I think one of the nice, th really nice things about pertubrutinib is obviously the response rates in the study are 50%. But if you respond, you know you're going to get a durable response. And we, we didn't share the swimmer's plot from the clinical trial, but, but patients either respond and respond very durably um, or they don't. Um, uh, to make the kind of obvious point, and it's fairly binary in that respect. So, so you'll know if you're going to get a response, and actually the durability looks looks pretty good. So, um, you, you you to some degree don't lose a huge amount by by trying by trying pertubrutinib um, here if available. So, so just to wrap this case up here, um, you know, so I think we sort of highlighted all the things that we talked about. So, what are the recommendations? Um, you know, I think this has all sort of been talked about before, that the use of other covalent BTK inhibitors is unlikely to be beneficial. Uh, in the United States, you know, as, as Toby mentioned, there's differences in the approved. He would be a consideration for this patient. And then again, we've really talked about non-covalent BTK inhibitors may be uh, appropriate in this setting. So uh, to wrap things up today, uh, here is a possible future algorithm for mantle cell lymphoma. I think we sort of, you know, hypothesized about what this may look like in the future. Uh, for those who are less aggressive chemotherapy, I still think that, um, you know, chemoimmunotherapy is going to be an option, things like bendamustine, rituxan. Uh, but there's more data for, for combinations of CD20 or, or combination, actually, of BTK inhibitors with BCL2 inhibitors, which have shown some promise uh, in the relapse setting. Um, in the aggressive therapy, you can probably do combinations. So chemoimmunotherapy with BTK inhibitors, um, you can, again, combine BCL2 with BTK, and, and it is even possible that for certain high-risk patients that things like CAR-T uh, may be part of the treatment algorithm in the front line. I think in the second-line setting, you know, the question is, just like that last case is, did they get a covalent BTK inhibitor in the front line? And if they did, that's going to change your second-line algorithm, and it might be things like non-covalent BTK inhibitors that you go to first, um, or CAR-T cell therapy, again, if they have not been prior exposed. And then third line or later, I think it's really going to be focused on new agents. So some of them are still um, upcoming, uh, things like bispecific antibodies, you know, newer forms of CAR-T that are targeting different proteins or antigens, uh, new non-covalent BTK inhibitors as well. 
Um, you can download this take home message as a side note, uh, as a way to prepare for new developments with BTK inhibitors in mantle cell lymphoma. Uh, but I think this is an overview and, and sort of our prediction as to how the field may look like in the future uh, based on the ongoing clinical trials that are occurring right now. So uh, we're gonna wrap this up now with the uh, here today. And um, I think me and uh, Toby will just brought forward today. So uh, starting with the first question here, Toby, what is your experience treating mantle cell with blastoid or pleomorphology uh, and specifically using BTK inhibitors for those patients? That's a, that's a great question. First up, it's uh, one of the most challenging clinical scenarios that we face in mantle cell lymphoma. I think with, um, in answer to that question is it's a, it's really difficult and um, you need to have your wits about you and always kind of think one step ahead. The brutinib uh, experience, those 370 patients, the, purport, the patients who had blastoid morphology um, had a median progression-free survival of approximately four to five months. So if you're thinking about, for example, CAR T-cell therapy in relapsed mantle cell lymphoma, you need to be thinking about it at the initiation of a covalent BTK inhibitor if you've got blastoid disease. Um, I think I mean, we, we've seen some kind of slightly more encouraging results with blastoid pleomorphic morphology therapy. So I suppose my overriding answer there is always think one step ahead and think CAR T in patients with um, aggressive disease um, in your clinics. Um, okay, so um, my question for Tanira, the next question is, is, is there a role um, for covalent BTK inhibitors and anti-CD20 um, combinations in, in elderly patients as a frontline um, therapy? Um, and uh, would you also consider an anti-CD20 antibody a logical partner for a non-covalent BTK inhibitor? Two questions in one. Yeah, uh, I think great question. You know, there is data actually now published, uh, actually just published this year, uh, looking at a combination of ibrutinib and rituxib who are not candidates for aggressive therapy. Now, there were some criteria there. They sort of chose patients. They were sort of low IK, KI67, non-blastoid histology, as we just talked about, um, but showed really promising efficacy and, and really a regimen that can be well tolerated in, in older patients. And, and I think something to consider in, in patients who are in, you know, 75 and above, uh, you know, elimination in this setting. In terms of, you know, should we use the CDTRs? Um, logic would suggest yes. But, but again, we shouldn't use logic to make our decisions. I think we need clinical trial data. Um, you know, the data we've talked about today is really for single agent pertubrutinib. Um, and I'm excited to see if they start to partner this drug with, uh, uh, partner with BCL2 inhibitors to see um, really what is the safety profile and whether or not that impacts the efficacy. So, so logically, I agree, but, but I always like to be data driven. Um, I think we have maybe time for one or two more questions. Um, here, Toby, what about this one? and BTKI inhibitor sort of indefinitely or as a bridge to CAR T-cell therapy? I think that's a great question. And to be honest, bridging to CAR T-cell therapy and mantle cell lymphoma is sort of a talk in and of itself and a, a very data poor area. And actually, I think it's an area that where, where people aren't certain what the best thing to do is. Um, I think it's not unreasonable to consider a non-covalent bridge because you get early responses and it's obviously well tolerated. So if people do respond to it, um, then you can effectively deliver a patient with a very well tolerated agent and debulk patient. So I can sort of see the attraction there. Of course, that's um, in many respects very non evidence based, and I think we need certainly data uh, to support that approach. But of course, many of these patients have had chemotherapy before, obviously a covalent BTK inhibitor before, and it may not be entirely clear what therapy to use. I think we know that using bendamustin-based therapy there can theoretically affect CAR T-cell fitness, particularly if you're really cautious with bendamustin-based therapy. But other than that, it's a pretty data-free area and something we need to understand a lot better. Um, uh, so I'm slightly sitting on the fence, but I'd say uh, possibly, yes, um, but we need some data. Well, I think right. we should probably wrap up here, um, Toby. So thank you so much, everyone here, for your time and attention. And we would just like to lastly uh, stop by saying, you know, visit us here at peerview.com, 2022 Mantle Cell, so you can do your post-test and evaluation for credit. Um, I think we've highlighted before, you can download the slides and practice aids, um, and you can always request a meeting at your institution. And I would like to, again, really thank you, Toby, for joining me here today. Um, we've done a couple of these together. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Nero. Mm -hmm.